Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. Well, good day to you, brothers and sisters. Going to show you something cool as always. This is part two in the series of Babylon the Great City. Where is it? Um, if this is subject is totally new to you, um, the Bible tells us that in the last days, the last seven years of the age, before the return of Jesus Christ to judge the world, um, there's going to be um, a city in the world somewhere where the final Antichrist, this man who is the arch nemesis to Jesus, the wonderful counselor, this man is going to be possessed by Satan at some point during the last seven years of the age, around the midpoint. Not exactly, but around the midpoint. And he's going to uh, start working. Him and his false prophet sidekick are going to start working signs, wonders, and miracles and deceive the whole world except for uh, um, professing followers of Jesus Christ who have the testimony of Jesus in their lips, on their lips, in their mouths, and who have the Holy Spirit residing in them, teaching them. Okay, the chosen ones, the blessed. Every, just about, and now we do know there's going to be some fence sitters, so I have to be careful. We know that from uh, scriptures outside of the book, book of Revelation. But there's going to be um, a city that's going to serve as the headquarters for the final Antichrist. And it's uh, very interesting that the Bible does tell us what city it's going to be. So that makes watching the news ten times more fascinating because you can see the plan of God in the Holy Bible coming to fruition. And, it, and as long as you're watching closely, and uh, I know we all hate to watch the news, we, especially what we see on the news today. It's not something we like to do. We don't like being news junkies. But when you're watching the news and you're seeing what's going on around the world, once you know what the future holds in reference to what the Bible says in the Word of God is going to happen, um, you can see it all coming together. So this series, this study, I'll do several PNG files. This one is uh, the second one that's part two, if you will, or method two in the way that you can tell which city on earth is going to be the headquarters of the final Antichrist who shall come against Jesus' inheritance, his holy people, uh, Israel, and his holy city, Jerusalem. Well, uh, this study shows you using the Word of God, where it's going to be. And uh, I hope you watch them all in order. You don't have to. I hope you will. They all name the same city or, or territory on the planet. Every single one of these are going to be in total agreement. Uh, but you might want to watch method one first. This is method two. So let's get right into this. Um, this particular chapter in the Bible that I have for you, Habakkuk or Habakkuk, however you want to pronounce it, chapter 1, gives us our answer. Method 1, which I hope you'll watch if you haven't seen it, was Isaiah 43, proving what city on the planet will serve as the headquarters to the final Antichrist. Isaiah 43 was method one. I hope you'll check it out. This is method two. This is Habakkuk, Habakkuk, <laughs> chapter one. Hallelujah. And I wanted to point out to you that you can act actually match Habakkuk 1, 6 with Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. If you're familiar with my studies of the last days, the 70th week of Daniel, you, you know that I love finding these numerical equivalents or these numerical matches when it comes to uh, information about the last days, future prophecies. And when the numbers match, and they don't always do, but when they do, it serves as like a witness, a second witness that the understanding being given is correct. And if you watched enough, enough of my short studies, you know that uh, 
I've pointed out dozens upon dozens of, and upon dozens of these numerical matches. And it's, it's, you're no longer wondering if I'm right or not. If you've watched enough of these, you know I'm right. But anyways, the, the hasty nation, the bitter and hasty nation that does not believe in Almighty God, Yah, the Holy One of Israel, and shall be used by God as a rod of anger to chastise his holy people in the last days, that hasty nation uh, is mentioned here in, in Habakkuk 1 and, uh, and also mentioned in Isaiah 28. Now, if you're familiar at all with Isaiah 28, there's absolutely no doubt that Isaiah chapter 28 is a chapter all devoted to the return of Jesus Christ at the end of the age. I really haven't heard of anyone that disputes that who's really looked at it and studied it. It's all about the winnowing fan that John the Baptist warned about when Jesus comes sitting to the right hand of the power, his father on the chair of the glory of the Lord, described in Ezekiel chapter 1, riding on the swift clouds above the winepress, above the threshing floors, when Jesus comes to sit and judge the nations before him, good and bad, uh, according to Matthew 22. But yes, Isaiah 28, 16 mention of the hasty ones, or the ones who act hastily, uh, is actually, um, we're given a little bit more information about them in Habakkuk 1. Kind of cool. This short study looks at how the Word of God warns the world concerning the coming strong delusion. Have you ever heard of such a thing? There's going to be 42 months of strong delusion, which acts like a hook in the jaw that's going to cause the people to err, make mistakes. People who are meant to be drawn to Satan will be drawn to Satan during the time of the coming strong delusion when the false prophet is working signs one in miracles and possibly even the Antichrist will be working signs wonders and miracles and we're told exactly how many months this period lasts and father is using it for a couple different reasons to identify to mark the perjurers uh, within Israel and within the world is Jew and Gentile marking the accusers of the brethren, um, those who want to destroy Jesus' inheritance, all of these people are going to be marked for destruction during the 42 months. And they're going to receive, uh, many of them, the mark of the beast, the final Antichrist, the man of sin, son of perdition. So, but that's the strong delusion which shall last for 42 months. We see who the people of the final Babylon, the great city, are in this chapter and how quick people from around the world will be drawn to this city and its king, which starts out as a caliph, and then when he's possessed by Satan, he just flat out says, I am now the god of gods. And then his sidekick starts supposedly... Uh, uh, giving witness to that and, and fire comes down from heaven and all kinds of miracles are going to be performed probably nice people being healed uh, the whole world's going to uh, think he is God he is the Messiah of the world or of the Messiah of Abraham's children however he words it all right people are going to have no doubt they're like God finally has identified who he is. It's about time. I knew someday he would tell me who he is. Well, that's what they're going to think, unless they know the Word of God, unless they've been taught the Word of God by the Holy Spirit, and you've been chosen to be a vessel of mercy and honor throughout eternity. People don't like to talk about that stuff. We should also take note of the way that the Holy Spirit numbered these passages as a way to give witness of their matching. I hope you got your favorite beverage with you. I've got to, uh, to take a few sips of some coffee here. I apologize. But yeah, take a little break for a second. And get ready to be fed. Hallelujah. Habakkuk 1, we see it here consisting of 17 verses. Have you ever read the book of Habakkuk? 
It's not very long. Have you ever read chapter one? Did you know it's a future prophecy? And it's not about uh, King Nebuchadnezzar coming against Israel in the past. So many of these minor prophets, prophecies, people thought have come and gone. It has nothing to do with the future. They couldn't be more wrong. And if you know uh, at least a little bit about future prophecies, I'm going to prove it to you. Every single verse matched almost with other uh, verses in the Holy Bible concerning the last days. Here we go. The prophet questions God's judgments. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, the prophet's question, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surrounds the righteous. Therefore perverse judgments proceeds. Now, that may just sound like it has nothing to do with the last days. It's just Israel whining over the centuries. They occasionally get defeated by their enemies. And it has nothing to do with necessarily our future. Well, you couldn't be more mistaken. And once you start studying the future prophecies of the last days, the 70th week of Daniel, in the days of the coming of the Son of Man, you realize that you can identify and match up two, three, four, five, six, seven scriptures with each other once you start learning key phrases and key words and key titles. For example, this how long in verse 2 is the how long in the fifth seal passage of Revelation chapter 6. And in fact, I've done a study on all the how long. Uh, verses in the Bible dealing with the last days. You should look up that study I did. And uh, there's, you know, how long countdowns, depending on um, which point in the last seven years of the age it's talking about. All right, this is the how long that's going to be spoken of actually during um, what's spoken of by Christians in Israel in the fifth seal, and then at the sixth seal, when the time of Jacob's trouble begins, it's also going to be asked, you know, how long, how long? But now the how long in Revelation 6 is talking about followers of Jesus Christ, messianic Christians as they start pouring into heaven as martyrs. And there's going to be martyrs all around the world. Okay, I don't want to make it sound like it's just in Israel, but it starts in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and Haifa. And, and the Middle East cities. Of course, they've been undergoing persecution for centuries, the Christians there. In verse 3, it caused me to see trouble. This is about the time of Jacob's trouble, which is six seal through the sixth bowl, those seven trumpet judgments curse of Deuteronomy 32 that shall pass over seven times, Daniel 9, verse 11, Daniel 4. Now, verse 5 gets really cool. This is the match to Isaiah 28. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded. This is talking about something that God's about to do in the last days that's never been done before. This isn't just your average butt kicking of Israel by its neighbors. No, no, no. This is something that's never been done before. This is something in the future. Our very near future is about to happen. It's called the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is just not the return of Jesus Christ at the end of the day of the Lord. That's the great day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord starts the day the six seals, seven seals are loosed and the first trumpet is blown. When that um, imminent invasion, that sudden destruction on Israel begins. That's when the day of the Lord begins. The day of the Lord's anger on his people. The wrath of the Lord of hosts on his people. The seven trumpet judgments. And then it, the seven trumpet judgments are not just about plagues coming upon them, similar to what came upon Egypt years ago. Oh no, this plague also comes with a massive horde army passing through the land. Um, 
But yeah, this is something special. Never been done before. It's the match to Isaiah 28. Now, I'm not talking about Jesus returning and, and threshing his enemies. No, that's at the end. I'm talking about the time of uh, Jacob's trouble. Okay, so there's the time of Jacob's trouble um, army that passes through the land. And then there is the climax to the time of trouble when now um, everything shifts. And at the seventh bowl, Jesus comes back and brings um, the ten kings who will then turn against the beast and burn her with fire. Jesus brings his immortal armies. So I got to be careful here when I'm talking about look among the nations and watch be utterly astounded. Okay, because this is the majority of the day of the Lord. Here in verse 5, let me slow down. Here in verse 5, this great work of God, he's going to bring chastisement on his people like never before. This verse 5 is the time of Jacob's trouble and the army that comes against Israel, one like they have never seen because it's not just one people. It's led by a particular group of people, but is it is an Assyrian alliance, an Assyrian alliance, who's not just massive, consisting of multiple nations, but it also helps and guards the children of Lot, who borders on Israel, and it also leads the fly and the bee army of Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 8, many of which millions are coming up out of northeast Africa to also join in this taking of Jerusalem, taking of Israel. So you have the be utterly astounded of the time of Jacob's trouble you see here. It is the match to Isaiah 28, but Isaiah 28 is mainly focused on the uh, army that Jesus is going to use, immortal and mortal, that comes against this army. Does that make sense? It's the match because they're both talking about the day of the Lord. I probably need to clarify that. But verse 5 is talking about this army that comes against Israel, one of which has never been seen before because it's the uh, what the Bible calls the hired razor flying the bee army led by the Assyrian alliance, which is led by the people of this territory, which is ultimately led by the man of sin, and Satan that possesses him. So this is the majority of the day of the Lord, and then Isaiah 28, which is talking about the same thing, but a different army, is the immortal armies of Jesus and the mortal ten kings who turn against the beast, like a winnowing fan overflowing scourge threshing in the Middle East from Isaiah 27 verse 12 says that Jesus and his immortal army will thresh from the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates River, whereas the ten kings will go outside of that threshing zone, even as far south during, uh, 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 even as far south of the Nile River Basin as Ethiopia and Sudan and Iran and Turkey, outside of Jesus' threshing zone. But yes, this is the day of the Lord, astonishing work of Almighty God, which has two phases. For I will work a work in your days, which you would not believe, though it were told to you. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation. That's a key word to this study. And how you can match it up with uh, Isaiah 28, 16. This bitter and hasty nation. See, Father used ISIS back around 2014, brothers and sisters, to be an example of what Father's going to do here in the next 10 or 15 years. Now we're going to see ISIS on steroids. You think the original ISIS was anything or something uh, very dreadful and terrible. You wait till you see ISIS on steroids and then possessed by their leader, possessed by Satan. All right, you ain't seen nothing yet. And people will hastily flock just like we saw people flock from around the world to the Middle East and join ISIS. I'm not saying that this Assyrian alliance is going to be called ISIS again. I'm not talking about the title, okay? But Assyria will lead. This Gog the Assyrian, this um, man of sin, will be an Assyrian. 
might come out of Turkey, might come out of uh, Syria, might come out of Iraq. We know where he's going to arise to power at, at the loosing of the first seal. The Bible is very clear in Nahum 1 and uh, in other places. Uh, he's going to come forth to power at the first seal at the meeting that's going to occur in Mosul, Iraq. That's the covenant of death that Israel will sign with its evil neighbors and its surrounding peoples, and they will be tricked, and their neighbors will act treacherously and come against Israel at the sixth seal. Um, when, the, when the scroll is opened that day, and the uh, day of the Lord um, comes, and Father will use this army as a rod of anger and chastisement against his people to purge away and take away their dross and alloy. To clean up the bride, if you will. You may say Israel's not the bride of Christ. Oh, yes, they are. The daughters of Jerusalem, Zion. But when I say things like that and it rubs you the wrong way, you may under, you need to understand Zechariah 13 and Ezekiel 5 say that Father's going to clean Israel up first. And then you can uh, be adopted into the family. He's going to make ensure, I hate to say this, that two out of every three people in Israel that are there today are about to die. And I don't like saying that, brothers and sisters. It saddens me greatly, and it should. And I, In fact, I try not to even focus on that thought. All right, that's men, women, and children, especially in the men. That's uh, Zechariah 13. That's Ezekiel 4 and 5. The uh, only thing that's going to be left is that one-third that's taken into slavery by the beast nations, by the beast cities. And a lot of them are going to go to this city to help build up its palaces in the last two or three years of this age of Satan. I don't like to give uh, motivation and ammunition to the enemies of Israel. I don't like to do it, but it's my job to tell you the truth so that you, being a follower of Jesus Christ, can get out of the way. Whether you're in Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, Syria, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, wherever you're at, Cleveland, Detroit, Oslo, wherever you are at, get out of the way of this thing that's coming, this scroll that's about to be opened called the Day of the Lord. And don't fall for Satan's lies and miracles. All right, let's match these up. Uh, so we just read verse 5. Verse 6, For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs, and they are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dig dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses are also swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. Well, again, the hastens are about the, the match to Isaiah 28, 16. This is this hired razor flying the bee army. And people come from afar to join this movement possessed uh, by this man who leads them, who's, who eventually will become possessed by Satan at the fifth seal. But people are going to start flocking to this man, even during the beginning of sorrows, when he's just a caliph, not possessed by Satan. But you have your answer, brothers and sisters, of what people are going to lead the Assyrian alliance, who's going to lead the hired razor, fly in the bee, to include the children of Lot that surrounds Israel. All right. The, uh, the people who's going to lead this effort is where the headquarters of the beast is going to be located on the Euphrates River, and it is the uh, Chaldeans, which is the Baghdad area of the planet. That's who's going to be Babylon once again, just like in the past. Father's not throwing you a curveball. Hallelujah. Who marches through the breadth of the earth. Remember, this army is 
one like you have never seen before. Do you understand? This is not a, just a large army that does damage to Israel. This is not talking about King Nebuchadnezzar taking them into slavery for 70 years. This is a future prophecy. You need to understand that. And if you're not sure, as we read the rest of Habakkuk 1, or Habakkuk 1, you will understand that, no, this is a future prophecy of the last days. That's why Father's telling you, you'll never, ever see an army like this again coming against Israel. Now, you will see a very large army, and Father will do amazing things using his immortal armies, weapons of indignation, he calls them, to include his mortal ten kings who turn against the beast armies. Father will do another wonderful, amazing work, even more amazing than this. When Jesus comes and people look up and see his cherub on fire riding on the swift clouds, and a stream of fire and brimstone coming out of the nostrils of Jesus Christ himself, it'll be even more amazing than this. But Father's trying to get your attention. This is about the day of the Lord. First comes the Antichrist army, then the wicked counselor, then comes Jesus, his arch nemesis, the wonderful counselor, commander of the Lord's army, leading mortal and immortal armies against the beast kingdom at the end of all of this. But yes, the match to uh, uh, this army, the way it is different, and the way it marches through the breast of the earth as it passes through this terrible and dreadful army, that'll just be so massive that it'll bring sudden destruction on everyone who it passes through their land. The match to this is... Uh, let me follow it here. Uh, Joel 2, verses 1 through 11. Isaiah 7, uh, verse 18. Isaiah 8, verse 7. That's an interesting numerical ma uh, match. And Jeremiah 4, verse 13. Okay, talks about this, the uniqueness and the, the, the terribleness of this massive millions of people that act like this as they're attacking and marching through the earth. Um, you need to you need to notice the match to that. Um, oh, the match to the I will work a work in your days which you would not believe though it were told to you. That is the match uh, of uh, Isaiah twenty eight twenty one. The astounding work of God. The amazing work of God. His unusual act. That's the match to that. I don't want to pass over these matches. Um, they fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. Okay, this again is the match to Isaiah 28, 16. They will come for violence. See, this is the army of Isaiah 7 and 8, uh, Jeremiah 4. Um, this is to start the day of the Lord. Coming against Israel in chastisement by Father. They will all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings and princes are scorned by them. Of course, a lot of this begins during the beginning of sorrows, first four seals. They deride every stronghold, for they heap up earthen mounds and seize it. Okay, that's the beginning of sorrows. That's the, And then you have the abomination of desolation event to signify that the fifth seal is now loosed. Thirty days later, here comes Satan cast to earth. And you need to take note that this is in verse 11. Habakkuk 1, 11. You have the wicked counselor uh, being possessed by Satan, or you could say Satan is coming forth in Habakkuk 1, 11. Now follow the match that I have for you. Notice that the man of sin will be possessed by Satan during the fifth seal, following the abomination of desolation event in Jerusalem. Listen, brothers and sisters, the wicked counselor comes forth. That's that man of sin, Gog the Assyrian. He shall come forth in Daniel 11, 21, and Nahum 1, 11. Here we see that he is possessed by Satan, or you could say Satan comes forth in Habakkuk 1, 11 to possess him. Uh, you need to pay attention to these numbers. Their arch nemesis is our Lord Jesus, the wonderful counselor, 
who came forth in Matthew 1, 21. Matthew chapter 21, he rides into Jerusalem, and Isaiah 11, verse 1, he comes forth. The root of David, the stem of Jesse, the root of Jesse. Hallelujah. Do you see these numbers? Yes, the Holy Spirit wants you to match these up. All right. This coming forth of Satan in Habakkuk 1.11. No one ever talks about it. Why not? Hallelujah. Transgresses. He commits offense, ascribing this power to his God. I mean, this is Daniel 11, 36 through 39, right there. When the mark of the beast goes out. And sure enough, right here in Habakkuk 1, that's the very next thing that the word of God starts telling you about is the marking uh, of the beast. Once Satan arrives, that's Daniel 11, 39, to advance and acknowledge the beast kingdom. If you've ever wondered in the book of Daniel, when does the mark of the beast goes out? It's Daniel 11, 39, three verses after the 42 month of strong delusion begins in verse 36, when Satan uh, causes this uh, little horn, this Gog the Assyrian, to start speaking blasphemies and pompous words. That's how you know the 42 months of war on the followers of Jesus Christ by Satan has begun and ends at the blowing of the seventh trumpet when the two witnesses have finished their testimonies, killed in the streets of Jerusalem, lay dead for three and a half days, and then are seen by their enemies ascending up into heaven, standing on their feet. Hallelujah! But no, that's not the resurrection to life. The resurrection to life and the rapture comes four to six weeks later at the pouring of the seventh bowl after the nations have been gathered. Jesus doesn't necessarily go to them. They come to him, hallelujah, to see him be revealed. But yes, that is that is so that is so Daniel 11 right there. All right, verses 36 through 39, here in verse 11 and 12. The prophet's second question, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. You have appointed them for judgment. O rock, you have marked them for correction. Yeah, the perjurers, the accusers of the brethren, Jew and Gentile. You are of pure eyes then to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously? Okay, that's the match to uh, Daniel 11 verses 29 through, excuse me, 21 through 28. That's the evil plans, the wicked schemes of Nahum 1, Psalm 83, who plot evil against the Lord. And hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he. Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? They take up all of them with a hook. They catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet. That's Satan catching those who belong to him. They're of their father, the devil. They're going to come from around the world and join this army. Just like during the days of ISIS, except this is going to be a hundredfold. You're going to see women and men and young men and young women who live on your block get on a plane and fly there to come against Jerusalem, Jesus' inheritance. You're going to see it. You're going to go, and we saw a little bit of it during uh, the days of ISIS. How did little Johnny get drawn to this? Well, because he was made, I hate to say it, he was predestined to be a vessel of wrath, a vessel of dishonor created before the foundations of the earth, that soul that was placed into that child. And you might say, well, brother, I know that matches Romans 9 and Romans 11, but I can't bring myself to even believe it. Well, I understand that. And, and even if you don't understand any of that stuff, it's okay. But you should be praying, begging, Father, pleading in advance before your children are born, before your grandchildren are born. Please, my Lord, I beg you. I understand your word. I beg you that my child or my grandchild will be born a vessel of mercy predestined from the foundations of the earth to be a child of the living God, Yah, the Holy One of Israel and his son, Jesus, for eternity. I beg you, Father, and I honor your word. Please forgive me. Have mercy on my family. Those are the things you should be praying for before that child's even born. 
And Father's going to, in most cases, honor your wishes because you're honoring his word and not denying it and putting it on a shelf and not teaching it. Hallelujah. They take up all of them with a hook. They catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet. Now, they're talking about taking slaves during the time of Jacob's trouble, especially Israel's cities, but it's also talking about souls. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Therefore, they sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their dragnet. Do you see that? That's talking about Babylon, the great city, the harlot shall fornicate with the nations until they wake up when the strong delusion is removed at the blowing of the seventh trumpet because by them their share is sumptuous and their food plentiful that's right they're plundering and their armies are happy they're plundering great nations and leaderships of great nations the leadership of Jordan is going to fall. The leadership of Saudi Arabia is going to fall. You see what I'm saying? The leaders, current leaderships are going to be replaced. They shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity. That continue is the match to Revelation 13, 5 and Revelation 17, 10. It will continue for a short time. Father's get telling you, answering the question, how long? How long do we have to put up with Satan? How long do we have to put up with the man of sin and his army? How long shall Christians undergo the wrath of Satan, not the wrath of Almighty God? Forty-two months. The Assyrian alliance will be led by Baghdad and the people of Chaldea. They will help and guard the children of Lot, as well as the rest of the nations mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and Psalm 83 and the book of Isaiah, as well as other passages in the Holy Bible, most of the nations that Jesus will destroy at his coming are found in the kindle of fire, burden against, send a fire against, and word of the Lord against passages in the Holy Bible. Remember, though, any mention of the nation of Israel in those passages only means severe chastisement and not utter destruction. Israel will be permitted to have one-third of their population alive when all this is said and done at the, at the return of Jesus Christ, whereas their evil neighbors and surrounding peoples will be permitted a much smaller remnant. And remember, Jesus comes back to punish the world for its evil. And all the kingdoms of the face on the earth shall drink of the cup of madness, says Jeremiah 25, that's poured at the seventh bowl when Father gets done chastising his people and removing their dross and alum. And what is the end game in all of this? So that Judah and Jerusalem can have the sons of Levi's in their mortal bodies, the foolish virgins, will be purged from their iniquities, transgressions, and sins, and they will be permitted to offer before the Lord a pleasant offering during the thousand-year reign of Christ. And that's where Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48 come into play. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, do you have any questions? Let me know what they are. This is part two. How do you prove that Baghdad is the future headquarters of the beast kingdom to include the fact that the Chaldeans will lead the uh, hired razor flying the, in the bee army led by the them the Assyrian alliance which is going to be made up of not only people from that part of Iraq but also from the area and Turkey and Iran and Syria they'll all be in an alliance this Assyrian alliance to come against, to trick with treacherous, with the treacherous dealings, the people of Israel, when their last prime minister, whoever that is, the foolish shepherd, worthless shepherd, shall sign this agreement to form this league at the loosing of the first seal in Mosul, Iraq, says Nahum 1.11 and, and Daniel 11.21 through 23. Hallelujah. There is no imminent return of Jesus Christ. There is such thing as an imminent invasion on Israel and sudden destruction. The day of the Lord 
uh, begins when the scroll is opened by the worthy lamb in heaven to purge away and take away the dross of Israel of Isaiah chapter 1. And then when he, it is done, is shouted of Revelation 16, 15, then it's time to pour the seventh bowl and Father will bring his son to sit and judge the nations. Hallelujah. So Baghdad, again, is proven to be the headquarters of the beast kingdom. And the people of Chaldea will lead the hired razor flying to me army mentioned in Isaiah 7 and 8 and Jeremiah 4 and Psalm 83 and Ezekiel 38. Uh, the Chaldeans will lead this effort. Now, having said that, I have no idea where the man of sin shall hail from. We know that it is what's called Magog. I believe it to be up around uh, Lake Savan, up there around Mer Mount Ararat, eastern Turkey, Armenia, that area. But regardless of where he's from, he will arise to power, we know it for sure, at the meeting in Mosul to signify the loosing of the first seal when he goes out to conquer and conquering during the beginning of sorrows, which shall last for 32 months once the first seal is loosed. All right, hallelujah. I hope you uh, enjoy this study, brothers and sisters. I have over 150, I believe, short studies that I keep in my 70th week of Daniel folder at Keep and Share. You can preview these PNG files and Word documents and Excel files. You can preview them. You can download them. It's safe. You have my permission to use them any way you want in your small groups. Hallelujah. I hope it's been a blessing to you, and I can't wait to see you next time. God bless.